We're going to talk about accelerating your WinUI 3 app with the Windows Community Toolkit. I am Michael Hawker, also known as the XAML Llama, thus the hat. I'm a senior software engineer uh, here at Microsoft, and I maintain and work on the Windows Community Toolkit, which is what we'll be talking a little bit more about later today. Uh, so just a quick overview of our session. We're going to be talking a little bit about what these community toolkits are and uh, why they exist, uh, giving you a bit of a crash course on why there's all these different Windows uh, UX frameworks, how they came to be, and where we are today with that, and how to get started on the latest and uh, latest one. Uh, to do that, uh, you might have heard of this thing called XAML. It's pretty common in Windows development today, and so we're going to give you a little bit of a brief overview about what that is and how that works, uh, so you kind of have all the basis covered for uh, getting started in your adventure in learning how to build a Windows app, and that's what we're going to be doing for the second half of the session is diving into Visual Studio and uh, using some Windows Community Toolkit components to get uh, started building a beautiful app on Windows. So what are the community toolkits? These are a collection of different libraries that are for .NET-based technologies. They are all open source up on GitHub under the MIT license, and we're part of the .NET Foundation. Uh, it's really about creating this collaborative space for our community of developers, Microsoft MVPs, engineers working at the company on various different uh, products and tools, like myself on the toolkit, uh, as well as the engineers that are working on the teams uh, building these platforms, you know, such as .NET or WinUI itself. Uh, and so you can find out more about our GitHub or get aka.ms slash toolkit. Uh, we have a variety of toolkits available. We have the .NET Community Toolkit, which is platform agnostic. So regardless of what .NET technology you might be using, I'd encourage you to look and see what's available there. There's a lot of different helpers, especially if you're doing very performance critical scenarios. Uh, and if you're doing UI development, we have the MVVM Toolkit, which works across any different UX um, platform you might be using. And Sergio, who uh, maintains the .NET Community Toolkit, is going to be giving a talk about that later, so I encourage you to check that out. If you've been following .NET Conf and hearing about this new MAUI platform as well, we have a MAUI Community Toolkit. They're giving a talk about that uh, later as well, so be sure to check that out if you're interested in MAUI development. Uh, and then I work, as I said, on the Windows Community Toolkit, which is for UWP and WinUI 3 developers, which is the, uh, the, the, what we're talking about today. And uh, so we have a bunch of controls and helpers for that. Uh, to help you get started on Windows development. And we've been doing a lot of our new work in this thing that we just released this year called Windows Community Toolkit Labs. So those are the components we're going to be showing you today, the latest and greatest stuff that we're, we're working on. Um, and part of our goal here is to create components that work across this you know, migration in the ecosystem from the current, uh, from, from UWP platform to WinUI 3 and this, this, this new world that's starting in, in that space, um, as well as looking at other spaces like Uno Platform brings uh, the Windows XAML to uh, other platforms and for things like WebAssembly. And uh, they're going to be talking a little bit more about what they're doing with WebAssembly uh, later here at UnoConf as well. So a few sessions to look at too. Um, but the Community Toolkit's really empowered by our community. And so it's thanks to them uh, that we're here and, and doing all this great stuff. And it's amazing to see what we can build together in the open. So I just really wanted to uh, congratulate everyone uh, and thank them for working with us. It's amazing to see what we can do and how we can empower each other to build great experiences. So with all that in mind, I wanted to jump back in time a little bit, uh, way back into the 90s. Uh, things kind of started on Windows UI development with this thing called MFC. It was for C++ developers and uh, working with Win32. And uh, you know, soon, soon, uh, not quite so soon after, but eventually this thing called .NET and C# -sharp was introduced, and they brought WinForms uh, along with it as this new way of creating uh, UI applications. Um, and then working off of you know, that and thinking about how do we build large-scale applications and separate the logic of how we build the UI from the back end of how that application works uh, brought this notion of XAML with WPF, um, again, for .NET based uh, in the desktop. Um, and you know, at, at the time, each of these platforms is you know, the latest, greatest way to, uh, to build applications, but doesn't necessarily supersede the work that's been done before it. Um, and so you, know, you still see apps being built with all these technologies as we move forward down this line. Uh, then in the Windows 8 and kind of evolving in the Windows 10 timeframe, we got this thing called Universal Windows Platform, UWP, which you might hear about. Um, and this 
uh, brought you know latest touch device interactions and other permissions to users and part of the sandbox, um, but was also targeting both C++ and C# -sharp developers. So um, regardless of what programming language you wanted to use, you knew now had a framework that you could leverage on the platform. Um, but as a developer, it was hard sometimes to you know, create the experience you wanted with the sandbox restrictions. And so that's where WinUI 3 comes into play and kind of really brings things back together so that you have the power and access to all those Win32 platform APIs, whether you're a C++ or C Sharp developer, on top of the, these latest tools. Um, and so that's what WinUI 3 is really all about. It's about having the latest and greatest Fluent controls and styles. Fluent is this design language of Windows, so that you'll see that on Windows 11. So when you're using WinUI 3, any component that you pull out of for the platform is just going to feel like it belongs there and fits in with the rest of the operating system. And that gives you this uh, you know, native UI performance, whether you're using C++ or .NET. Of course, we're at .NET, .NET Conf, and so it supports the latest .NET versions and C Sharp versions. Uh, the other interesting thing about WinUI 3 is that it's uh, part of a NuGet package. So you can decide when you want to upgrade. It's actually part of the Windows App SDK. So you'll see these terms of Windows App SDK and WinUI 3 um, kind of usually thrown around together. Um, and so they're part of this NuGet package. And so as an app developer, if there's an update, you're not quite ready to update. You're about to ship your app. You can wait and kind of do that later if you need to, because it's just uh, a version that you update in your project to pull down the latest version. Uh, the other thing I wanted to call out is, you know, I mentioned these multi-platform frameworks such as MAUI and UNO platform, and when they're targeting Windows platform, they actually use WinUI 3 underneath the hood to get that native look and feel. Um, so that's kind of how these different technologies are, are kind of related to one another. Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of touch on is why is it WinUI 3, right? Why, why did kind of things start with version 3? And it didn't really start with version 3. Uh, we can kind of think of version 1 as the original operating system controls and kind of how the beha apps behaved. Um, and so you'd build your app and it would release on a specific version of Windows. But if there was a new version of a control that you wanted to leverage, you kind of had to wait for your users to upgrade to that version before you as a developer could leverage that component, which was a little bit hard to kind of manage and time and make sure you're trying to take advantage of these late, latest and greatest features that we were releasing. Uh, and so that's where the WinUI 2 library came along. It was a set of the latest controls that were now uh, agnostic to the operating system. So you as a developer could include this package, use the latest control, and then be able to, to run that on any machine without having to wait for your users to upgrade their operating system. Uh, and so the next kind of evolution of this is uh, for WinUI 3, and this is really about combining both of those different pieces. So not only the controls, um, but all of the rendering aspects. So your app is going to run and look the same across whatever uh, version of the operating system that you're using. Uh, and so we in the Windows Community Toolkit have been, you know, in the past building components for UWP and, and the stack on the left, um, and now also want to take all those controls uh, and build them for WinUI 3 since it's, you know, mostly compatible code-wise um, between these two frameworks since it's the next evolution. Um, and so that's what we've been kind of doing in this Windows Community Toolkit Labs and what we're planning for the next version of the Windows Community Toolkit so that all of our components are consistent and work the same across uh, whichever framework you're using, whether that's uh, an existing UWP developer, whether you're a new developer looking to start with WinUI 3, or exploring other uh, technologies like Uno Platform and bringing experiences to uh, Android, iOS, or the web uh, with WebAssembly. And so our goal here is that if you're a developer and using a component from the toolkit, uh, regardless of w which migration or what framework you might be trying to use or, or move uh, the code base to, that the code from the toolkit that you're going to be using is exactly the same. Uh, and so that's, that's our goal moving forward uh, and uh, uh, what we've been starting with our Windows Community Toolkit Labs. So how do we actually get started with development? So the first start kind of thing with Windows uh, development to understand is this thing called XAML, which I mentioned before. And XAML stands for Extensible Application Markup Language. And it's a way that you can define your user interface uh, in XML. If you're uh, kind of familiar with web technologies, you can kind of think of it as a combination of both HTML and CSS. It both defines the layout and presentation of your application, as well as the style and the look and feel of those components within it. 
Um, however, XAML developers will typically separate these concerns into separate files. So you generally have pages that are more content driven and showing the structure and, uh, and actual uh, prose of your application, as well as resource dictionaries for the styles, which will define how things look and feel. And so you can kind of see this in this example here below. I have a text box. Uh, text block with a text property it says, of course, hello world. Uh, and then I'm referencing a style, which I've defined in a separate file, which is actually my uh, global application. Uh, and so with this style, I can change things like the font size or the margin, uh, and then use that anywhere I need to within my app. So that's one thing XAML lets us do. Uh, the real power from XAML comes from data binding, which is how we automatically update the UI when we change something with our code behind. So this uh, really kind of reduces the need for manipulating our UI with code and trying to change the text when stuff happens or you know, toggle visibility. Uh, we can uh, really kind of just focus on what our app is doing and how it's connected to the data. Um, and this is usually handled by something called the MVVM pattern. I'm not really going to go into it much today, but as I mentioned before, we have a toolkit for that. Uh, funny how that works. Uh, there's also some uh, talks about um, how that uh, uh, is used later that we've done in the past as well. So I'm using a, a quick example here on the right. So I have a data object model that has an observable property. And that's the key kind of key piece there uh, that has some, some text. And then on the left in my XAML, I'm using this XBind statement to do this data binding um, to actually connect to that object that I call data and the property, my text, and I've bound that to the text box. So now when the user types in the text box, that's automatically going to update that object in my code, um, or if I have some other thing that changes it, then it'll automatically update and reflect that in my user interface. Um, and so that's where the observable property really comes into play. Rather than the UI constantly trying to like refresh itself and pull every single property that we've, you know, looking for and say, hey, what's your value? Instead, it's up to the object with that observable property to say, hey, I've changed my value for this property. And then the UI knows where that property is and can just go more efficiently update the part of the UI that's actually changed. Um, so that's where the, the benefit comes here uh, with data binding. Um, the other thing we do with XAML a lot is use these things called data templates. And so this is really, you'll see this a lot with lists. And so that's how we take that you know, object that we had before, but translate it into some UI. So rather than trying to create a whole bunch of UI in our code behind or uh, trying to adjust our, our data and how our application works to like fit into these UI concepts, we can instead kind of separate those concerns, have this data template on the left where we say, okay, this is what an, my item looks like and I'm gonna create two text blocks to display it and bind these like we saw with the data binding before to this ID and title property that I've created on my item. Uh, and so now, as you can see below, for each item in the list, I can use that data template in XAML uh, and just automatically know how to translate this item from our code into some UI that we can use. So let's actually dig into Visual Studio now and figure out how we get started. So I'm gonna be using Visual Studio 2022 today. Uh, we want the .NET desktop development workload and the Windows 10 SDK. Um, and I'm gonna be using this cool extension called Windows Template Studio. Uh, you can find the uh, Template Studio in your extensions uh, catalog. Uh, and it gives you this new template for creating the application, which really kind of is this giant wizard that kind of does all this application boilerplate so you can really kind of focus on your application's experience rather than having to worry about how to do all the nitty gritty bits underneath the, the hood. Uh, and then I'm going to pull in a couple of Windows Community Toolkit Labs components, the latest things we're working on, to show you how we can use those to uh, bootstrap our application development today. So uh, let's jump over to the desktop here and uh, start an application. Uh, so let me pull up Visual Studio, <clears throat> and we'll see in the solution. Uh, I basically just gone through that wizard already. I did all the defaults, so nothing, nothing really too new here. I'll point out where, where I've made changes to, to speed up our, our presentation today. But uh, I've got this whole structure of an application all set up. I've got this nice readme that pops up and kind of tells me the, you know, where I can get started and what I can do and look at, um, and different things all set up all today. And if I go look over at the app that I have running here, we can just see it's this basic shell. It looks like a Windows app, uh, has some basic navigation stuff laid out, but it's, it's pretty blank. It doesn't, it doesn't do much right now. Um, but it, it gives us this whole canvas to start working on to, uh, to build an application. 
Um, so I'm going to go into this views folder. Uh, that's the, the default location where Template Studio creates our pages. And I can go to this main page, and here we see some XAML. I've got this grid. Uh, and I can just uh, add a text block in here, like uh, we saw before. And we can see I have some IntelliSense here to show me what types of controls are available. And there's other attributes uh, that I can adjust here so we can have things like different alignment properties. Um, I'm going to start uh, looking at the text. We can talk more about alignment later. Uh, and so we can just say, like, welcome to .NET Conf. And I can close this tag. And then if I go back to my app, we can actually see that uh, the application is updated based on the, the changes I made to the XAML right away. So uh, you can use this hot reload feature to kind of make some tweaks and adjustments as you're working on your code and uh, see things that are running. Um, but let's you know, spruce this up a little bit more uh, first and see if we can um, add some pizzazz to our application. Um, so in order to do that, I need to pull in some NuGet packages. NuGet is this location where uh, and system where you can kind of pull in these external dependencies. Um, and so we're just going to right click on our project and go down to Manage NuGet Packages. That's going to bring up the NuGet uh, interface here in Visual Studio. Um, now, by default, usually a lot of stuff is up on the main NuGet index, and you can, you can just search for it and find it. Uh, in the case of our Windows Community Toolkit Labs, we have a separate feed. So I've just clicked a little settings icon in here and added a new item for our Windows Community Toolkit Labs. Um, oops, uh, as well as have uh, this, the URL in here. And I'm going to link to a blog post we have later uh, that has the step-by-step -step instructions on, on how to add that in there for you. Uh, and you can see I've already pulled down these two Community Toolkit Labs packages. We have uh, Settings Control and Rive Player. And so Rive Player is uh, a way to add Rive animations to your application. Uh, Rive is really cool technology, uh, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And so we're just going to add one of these animations to our app. I've actually uh, already added a file. Uh, you can see animation.riv here to my assets. Um, and if I look at the properties, I just wanted the only thing I've wanted to do is make sure that's set to content, so it'll be included with my application. Um, and so now I can come back to my XAML, and we can add one of these players to display the animation. So just like in C Sharp. Uh, I want to add a using statement uh, to be able to reference this. So I'm going to create an XML namespace. I'm going to give it an alias, such as Rive. And so now I can say using community toolkit dot labs dot winui dot Rive. Uh, and so this will give us that option to, uh, to use these components from that namespace now. And so now I can just do Rive player. And let's say I want to give this a specific width and height. I can uh, just set these properties in here, and I might want to uh, configure some other options. Uh, and then I'm going to provide it a source. And so I can use this MX Apex uh, URL to basically reference something within my application. And so here I'm just going to you know, use the assets folder and that animation.rive. And so now I can run this application. So the cool thing about Rive is it's an animation editor and also this runtime that provides stateful animations for your application. So it's not just an animation that you can run and go through, but you can actually connect it to different logic in uh, the state machine uh, in order to, to do a variety of different things and uh, make very complex animations. And so... Um, uh, so once we get going here, uh, we'll see this pop up. And we can see our little Yeti animation here. Uh, he's kind of bobbing up and down. Uh, we'll make him do some more interesting stuff there. <laughs> His eyebrows just popped up. If you blinked, you might have missed it. Um, but, uh, but we'll come back to this. We want to like add some settings here, right, and make our application feel a little bit more uh, filled out and, and maybe um, provide some more stuff here for us to do. Um, so I'm going to go right click uh, in our views folder here, right? So I want to add a new page. And I'm going to use the template studio option to do a new page. And this is going to bring up that wizard. Uh, and so now I can have a settings page, right? Just um, something that's very common to most applications. It's automatically going to add theme selection and some storage to remember those settings and actually uh, show us all the changes uh, that it's going to make to our application. So now I can just hit Create. It's going to go add in uh, these pages. Um, and so here I have a settings page. Um, and we can see it just has a, a stack panel and some radio buttons. Um, <clears throat> 
uh, in here. And so I'm going to run this and we can see what it looks like. And if we look at uh, other applications, right, um, let's say it's just a calculator, uh, it has a settings page. I mean, there's not too many settings in calculator, but it has this nice little display and app theme. And so it can let us configure our app. Um, and this is, you know, all that theme selector and storage that Template Studio was adding into our app for us was kind of creating these behaviors for us um, and creating the settings page. So kind of, we'll see what this looks like here uh, when it gets going. Uh, and so now I can go to the settings page that's appeared, and we can see we have our light dark theme settings, but it doesn't look the same, right? It doesn't have that, that ni this nice drop down and card look and feel that we kind of introduced with Windows 11. That's not uh, something that's built into the platform, um, but as part of the Windows Community Toolkit and our labs, we've actually created a component that lets us easily add these experiences into our applications. So I'm gonna go back up to our namespaces. I'm gonna add a labs here. Uh, so I'm going to have UI. I'm going to add the Rive one back here as well. Uh, Labs.winui.rive. Uh, and so now uh, I can, you know, add a spacing property in here. This is going to give some space for when we add different things in here. And I can actually include a settings card. Uh, into our application, and I can uh, actually go and look at our Toolkit Labs uh, website, uh, which uh, didn't fall asleep there, but we have examples and settings on our website, which we'll be updating more shortly. Um, but I can just grab the example that from our samples of the settings card uh, and paste that in here. We're not going to want uh, a name, and we're not going to toggle its uh, 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 it, that property there. We're instead going to add a a description like select a theme, and we can change the header to uh, app theme. And we can see that it has an icon here as well. We can go look up what that code is in a second. Uh, and I'm just going to grab this stack panel with these radio buttons that defined how we could toggle our, uh, our option there. And I'm going to put those in the settings card. Um, so now we can uh, see what this looks like here as we get started. Um, and so, you know, I had this code E7999, and there's actually this really cool app called Character Map UWP in the Microsoft Store. Um, and I can actually just uh, go and search for that in here, and we can see it's this aspect ratio uh, icon. But, you know, we wanted the, that color palette icon. I can go search for that and see that that's uh, E790. I can actually just copy that code uh, in here onto my clipboard. Uh, and so now we'll have uh, that to try out in our application. Oh, here's our uh, settings now. So here we have the card. We can see that aspect ratio icon. Um, but, you know, by default, the settings card has our radio buttons over on the right. We want to have that expander and kind of have them below. Um, so let's go quickly uh, add one of those in here. Um, and so we can use this other thing called a settings expander. Um, and it actually takes all the same properties. It's, it actually acts like a settings card as well. So I can just copy these over here. I can change our card to expander here. Uh, it needs to match the above. And then it has a property called um, uh, items as well. And so the items properly just takes other settings cards. And so we can actually just copy the settings card uh, into our item here and just close our tag. Um, and then I'm going to add a couple of those alignment properties that I had uh, mentioned before. I'm going to set um, uh, content uh, alignment to vertical uh, to give us some more space in the settings card. This is a unique property to the settings card. Uh, and then horizontal content alignment uh, to stretch. Uh, so yeah, horizontal alignment, horizontal content alignment, these are kind of common XAML properties that you'll see uh, quite a bit uh, in different cases and kind of define how things are going to be laid out and react to being resized in your application. Um, so, um, so yeah, so hopefully this is just going to look exactly like our calculator app here and give us this little drop down of the theme. Uh, and then there's just one other quick thing I want to go back to our animation for, um, and then we'll hopefully have time still for another question at the end. Um, 
But so there's our animation and here's our settings component. We see how we have the updated icon and now our radio buttons just look like they did in calculator, which is really awesome. Uh, so let's, let's uh, quickly do something with our arrive uh, animation before we run out of time today. Uh, and that's one of the things I love about XAML is I can just come over to my page here, cut this out of it, and paste it in my other uh, XAML file and not have to worry about a thing, basically. Um, and I'm going to add uh, another settings card here. And I'm going to give that a toggle switch and give it a name called uh, is hands toggle. And let's say it just has a header of uh, wave hello. Uh, and then Rive has these inputs, like I mentioned, for the state machine. So I can actually add this Boolean input uh, and I can give it a target to uh, is hands up, which is defined by the animation file in this case. But I can use our data binding to bind to my toggle switch. So I'm going to use the name is hands toggle dot is on. Um, and now with that data binding, that toggle will be connected to this input for the state machine. And then I'll be able to uh, control that animation with my um, uh, application logic here. Um, uh, ah, I mis <laughs> mistyped it. Always a typo. At least it told me that it was it couldn't find it. So uh, so sometimes you know you have to live debug on the spot. It happens. Um, and so this will rebuild now. And um, uh, so that's the kind of really great thing that I enjoyed with our partnership with Rive to bring this technology to Windows. It's uh, really amazing that we can leverage the power of XAML with their runtime engine to uh, control these amazing animations, as we'll see here in a second. Uh, so I'm going to switch back to our settings control. We have our Yeti. Um, and uh, if I can click on the button, I'm not sure what I did wrong. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I put the header on the wrong spot. I put it on the toggle switch instead of the settings card. Oh, no. Uh, let's see if I have time to restart. Uh, <laughs> uh, because it's really cool, I promise. <laughs> um, in the meantime, I'll just quickly uh, throw up the links here. Uh, it's, uh, just in the background, uh, it's hard to see. I can't do that uh, without switching everything up. Um, but uh, the most important one is uh, toolkitlabs.dev. I'll flash these on a screen for a second uh, so we can screenshot them. Uh, but here is our Rive animation. And here's our toggle switch. And so now he's a shy bear. Um, but this is a really cool thing with Rive. Now we've directly connected this component to the animation and uh, can really see some, some cool stuff that's enabled by this technology. Um, so as I said, I have some links here. So we have our toolkitlabs.dev uh, website that we will be uh, updating shortly. Uh, I have a blog post that went up at aka.ms slash ifdef that explains how to get started with all the stuff I showed you here today. Uh, and then we have our toolkit links as well, uh, which are pretty easy to find on the web. Um, but uh, I'm running short on time. Hopefully we might have time for one quick question, but thank you so much. And uh, back to you. Live demos are hard, but you made that it, That was Michael. amazing. <laughs> Suspense. <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we don't have questions from the board, but make sure you post your questions with the hashtag Donet Comp for us to answer live. That's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you had a good question, though. Yeah, I was wondering, like, with with Donet Maui and Win UI three, like, what are the trade offs when you pick one versus the other? Like, Donet Maui is multi platform, Win UI is specific for Windows development. So, what do you get when you use Win UI three and the Windows Community Toolkit? Right. Yeah, that's a great question, and and you kind of hit it right on the, the the nail on the head there. With you know, Maui is is geared towards multi-platform development. So if you're looking to to do stuff across different platforms, that's where you get the benefit there. Um, the advantage of WinUI three and the Windows Community Toolkit is that if you're just targeting Windows specifically, you get all the different power and flexibility to do whatever you need to do within your application, uh, as well as make use of the wide variety of components like I showed today in the Rive Player and the Settings Control from the Toolkit uh, in order to empower your apps. Awesome. 
I, I just love like the power of like integrating in things like Rive. I've been looking at Rive lately and being like, how difficult is that to integrate? And you just showed it. Super <laughs> simple. <laughs> Super cool.